All right, think of the most outrageous promise you've ever heard. Just think about it for a second. Maybe something that you struggled to believe or something you knew was false. You know, early Coca-Cola ads said there were many health benefits from that drink. And early cigarette ads said science had proven there were no negative health effects of smoking. Candidate George H.W. Bush, read my lips. No new taxes. Candidate Barack Obama promised to lower our health care costs. Right? I mean, if I'm elected, there will be a chicken in every pot. An end to war and poverty, and the lion will lie down with the lamb. Promises only Jesus can deliver on, right? Well, what about a promise that you'd like to believe? Something you would like to hear? Mothers, your children will be safe. And they will grow up walking with the Lord. Winston, Wayne, Marvin, Mike back there. Next year at this time in the fall festival parade, we will have a float. And you guys will be breakdancing for Jesus down the street. No? Okay, maybe that's in the outrageous category. But how about for the next year, your health will be good. And you'll be able to take care of yourself. We want to receive promises today. We want to believe in them. I want to believe that Leanne loves me and she will never leave me. I want to believe that my mattress will last 10 years like they tell me it will. I want to believe that our 11 geothermal HVAC units in this church are going to last 20 years. Oh, we all want to believe that. They're expensive. But we all know how often promises are broken. Sometimes people are dishonest right from the start. Sometimes they stop caring about their word, and sometimes things are just out of their control. Today we're going to hear a promise from Jesus, and I want you to believe it absolutely. Jesus is honest, and he never changes, so he's not going to give up on caring about his integrity or on your well-being. And there is nothing out of his control. Plus, as we're going to see, Jesus' promise is backed by the authority, 100% of God the Father Almighty. So this is a promise we can take to the bank. Let's pray, and then we'll see what this promise is. Father, please bless us this morning. We have this passage in the Gospel of John. We ask that you would Illuminate it for us, that you would enlighten our minds and encourage our hearts, that studying this passage this morning together would actually cause us to grow, to be more like Jesus and grow in our faith, maybe even grow in our joy and our sense of peace. We ask that you bless us as we seek to bless you with our worship this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can open up your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 22. I think we have a little bit of something for everybody today. We have some deep Bible study for those of you of the intellectual persuasion. And we have some exciting and encouraging application for those of you who are more into that kind of thing. So let's dive into the text. We'll see what God is revealing to us today. Gospel of John, chapter 10. Verse 22, it says, Then came the feast of dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple area in Solomon's portico. Now the festival of tabernacles, which we talked about in John chapter 7, chapter 8, that would have been in late September, early October. Now it's December for the feast of dedication, or your translation might say the festival of rededication. Today this is known as the feast of lights or more commonly in our country, as Hanukkah. Now this is not a feast that God commanded the Jews to observe. Rather, it commemorates something that happened after the Old Testament was complete, but before Jesus was born. During that time period, the Persian Empire fell to the Greek Empire, and one of the Greek rulers, Antiochus Epiphanes, set up a pagan altar in the temple of God. And he outlawed possession of any part of the Jewish scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. 
in 165 BC, Jewish rebels led by Judas Maccabeus recaptured the temple and rededicated it to the one true God, Yahweh. And they celebrated on that site for eight days. And so that became the custom, eight days of celebration. This festival was not as grand as those that God commanded because you could celebrate this one at home instead of everybody coming to the temple in Jerusalem. So about 200 years after the rededication of the temple, Jesus was in Jerusalem and at the temple. It's winter. The temperature probably was in the 40s, maybe even colder. And it often rains at that time of year. So Jesus was walking in what's called Solomon's portico. There was a covered walkway that went around the perimeter of the temple mount. And that's the sides pointing towards the temple itself or the temple courts were open to the air with the roof supported by those massive pillars you saw in the video. Solomon's portico was on the east side, and I'm sure Jesus was walking there because of the weather. Verse 24, the Jewish leaders surrounded Jesus and asked, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now the movie has common people talking with Jesus in this scene. The Greek word is ambiguous. But I think there would have been a crowd there. It is a feast, even if they didn't have to be at the temple. But I think Jesus is engaging again with the Jewish religious leaders, and you'll see why as we go on. And what they literally ask him, according to the Greek text, is how long will you take away our life? That sounds kind of strange, but it was an idiom. It was a way of them asking, how long will you keep us from coming to a conclusion? Or how long will you keep us in suspense? They want Jesus to declare to him them whether he is the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ. It's possible they had one aspect of Old Testament prophecy in mind. Maybe they're hoping to be delivered from Roman control. Maybe something else. Now remember, Jesus has been teaching and doing miracles at this point for a couple of years. And we know that he's been in kicking around Jerusalem for several months from what we've read in John chapter 7, 8, 9, and the beginning of 10. He's done many miracles in this time, some of which clearly pointed to his identity because they referenced back to specific Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Plus, Jesus has been teaching about his identity over and over. Verse 25, so Jesus replied to them, I told you, and you do not believe. The deeds I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you refuse to believe because you are not my sheep. Two weeks ago, we were studying the beginning of this chapter, and we heard Jesus teaching in parables about himself, saying that he was God's shepherd, the good shepherd, and the gate for the sheep. Jesus is playing on those teachings now by telling his doubters that he has given them ample evidence of his identity, but they still do not believe because they are not his sheep. Verse 27. Jesus continued, he said, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them from my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Those who belong to Jesus hear his voice and follow him as their shepherd. This reiterates previous teaching by Jesus that those whom God gives to Jesus receive God's grace and have their eyes opened to see clearly. And so they come to saving faith in Jesus, believing in who he is as the divine son of God and the human Messiah Savior, and believing in what he accomplished in his crucifixion and resurrection, that Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sins so that we could be forgiven, reconciled with God, and given eternal life. Jesus mentions eternal life here, and then he defines it. Those who respond in faith to Jesus and thus follow him receive the gift of new spiritual life, which is eternal. That is, they will never perish. The Greek text is very emphatic 
It's like Jesus said, I give eternal life to them, and they certainly will not perish into eternity. And this is Jesus' promise. Jesus also says, nobody can snatch them from his hand. Our salvation is based on the righteousness of Jesus, not on our own. So nobody and nothing can take that away. Jesus, again, offers assurance by reminding us that God the Father is the mightiest individual. He's the mightiest force in the universe. He's so powerful that he created the whole universe simply as an act of his will, simply by speaking. He's so powerful that he can know every thought of every person all the time. That he can know what is going to happen in every moment and even intervene in history, even if he wants to go against nature by acting supernaturally, if he so chooses. This God Almighty is the one who gives individual people to Jesus. And so we need never fear that anyone, including Satan, including demons, we don't have to fear that anyone can tear us away. The point Jesus is emphatically making is that while his doubting contemporaries cannot know him, those who do know him and believe in him and thus follow him, have their salvation guaranteed. If you have been saved by grace, through faith, in Christ, then you will go to heaven the moment you die. And you will be resurrected someday to new physical life on a renewed earth, and that will last forever, into eternity. This is Jesus' promise. And Jesus and God the Father guarantee it. And as we've already learned before, they sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us as a sign of that guarantee. Now, over the past couple of years, we've talked about assurance of salvation and perseverance of believers multiple times in sermons. But if you still want to study this a little more, you have questions, let me know, and I'll point you to some resources. Jesus also emphasizes here that he and God the Father are one. Now, the NET, which I'm using today, and many other English translations turn this around to make it into proper English, but the Greek text makes it obvious that Jesus is emphasizing something about himself. He says, I and the Father are one. They wanted him to declare his identity. Well, here it is. From the beginning of this gospel, the author John has been explaining to us who Jesus is, emphasizing that he is the Son of God incarnate. That means Jesus is the divine and eternally existing Son of God who came to earth in the flesh to be the sinless human Savior. Now, we believe that God has revealed himself to be triune or a trinity, God the Father, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. Each of them are distinct in their personhood and in their activity, but they are so unified in their essence, their character, their will, that they are one God together. And this is emphasized by the way Jesus said this. In the Greek text, he used a neuter. It's like saying that he and the Father are one thing, not one person. You see, they have distinction. They have their own personal identity as the Father and as the Son. But being so unified in essence, character, and will, they are one God. Jesus has said this before, and it's upset everybody. So let's see what happens now. Verse 31. The Jewish leaders picked up rocks again to stone him to death. Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good deeds from the Father. For which one of them are you going to stone me? The Jewish leaders replied, We are not going to stone you for a good deed, but for blasphemy, because you, a man, are claiming to be God. Okay, so just like before, when they hear this, they want to kill Jesus. Now, how many of you are wondering why there's this pile of rocks handy on the Temple Mount? 
Yeah, at least one, right? Okay, I would wonder about it. I mean, are kids gathering rocks for a game they're going to play later as part of the festival? Do the religious leaders just keep a pile of rocks in case they want to kill somebody today? Probably not, right? Really what I think is happening is the temple has been under construction, the Temple Mount, for decades at this point, and so they're probably just not done. And there's a pile of rocks that they're working with sitting there ready for throwing Now, they had asked for identification, but in their mind, Jesus has gone too far. They might have been willing to believe in a human Messiah, a Savior, but they can't believe in one who is divine and human. They didn't believe that God was a trinity. They believed in God the Father. They believed the Holy Spirit, when it was mentioned in their scriptures, was just God's spirit, like we talk about our spirit or our soul, just a part of God. They didn't see the Holy Spirit as an individual who was all of God and yet one of three who were God together. They didn't understand the Old Testament prophecies about the Savior being both God and man. Well, Jesus is being ironic here. He reminds them of all the miraculous evidence he's provided to them and he asks, well, for which miracle are they going to kill him? And they say, of course, it's not about his works. It's about his words. They believe he is merely a man, but claims to be God. Or as the Greek text literally says, he claims to be divine. They take offense at this. They see it as an insulting false teaching about the nature of God himself. And the penalty for that in the Old Testament was death. Now, under Roman rule, they should have taken it through the courts first. But then, as now, sometimes emotions get a little bit too fiery, and people take the law into their own hands. Verse 34, Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If those people to whom the word of God came were called gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say about the one whom the Father set apart and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? wow, obviously we're moving into the intellectual part of this, right? This is going to take some explanation because that's pretty confusing. Jesus is quoting Psalm 82, verse 6 here. And usually when somebody spoke about the law, they were referring to the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, and those did not include the Psalms. But sometimes when they said the law, they meant the whole Bible as they had it then, which is our Old Testament. In Psalm 82, verse 6, The language is a little more emphatic than it comes across in English. It's God talking. And God says, I myself said, you are gods and all sons of the Most High. So Jesus is contending, if God the Father himself referred to others as gods and sons, then how can the religious leaders object to Jesus, the one God the Father consecrated and sent into the world, calling himself the Son of God? Well, we might wonder about God calling anyone else gods, right? This is a difficult psalm to interpret, but I've invested several hours in that effort, and I think we can explain the sense of this. Yahweh, the true God, in the psalm, calls these people gods in the sense that they are his sons. They're sons of the Most High God. And he calls them sons in the sense that they are representing God. They are reflecting his character. They are to be his image. So God referred to them as gods in that they were supposed to be acting under God's authority, representing God to the world. And God actually used similar language before with Moses. So Jesus says, if such terminology is not blasphemous, if even God the Father has used it, how can they object to what he is saying? All right, but I'll tell you something. I think it is very interesting that Jesus chose to quote this psalm when he made his point, when he could have made his point many other ways, most of which would have been easier for us to understand. In this psalm, God has called some people sons and gods because he's assigned to them the duty of administrating in his name. But now, in the psalm, he's criticizing those gods, those sons, because they had failed God. They had failed to uphold justice. 
and thus they would be condemned, and God himself would take care of his people. Does that sound familiar from two weeks ago when we were studying chapter 10, verses 1 through 21, and we looked at Ezekiel 34? It's the exact same thing. In other words, Jesus ironically is implying that those who are now trying to kill him, they are the ones God the Father had called gods as his representatives. And now they have failed God. And they themselves will face judgment from God the Father. And Jesus says the scripture can't be abolished. It can't be broken. They will face judgment for letting God down. And in the previous teaching we heard about the start of this chapter two weeks ago, it is Jesus whom God the Father chooses to be his shepherd over his people, to replace those thieves and robbers who were supposed to represent him before. Now, perhaps the psalm had a historical basis when it was written, but it was also prophetic. And Jesus invokes it for his situation right here. And that being the case, these religious leaders, the ones who have just picked up rocks to kill Jesus, would face God's wrath. So there's irony here in that the religious leaders want to kill Jesus, God's ultimate representative for being offensive to God. But Jesus says they are going to be condemned by God for failing God as his representatives. It's also ironic they want to kill the man Jesus for pridefully claiming to be divine when the reality is that the divine Son of God condescended, humbled himself to come as a person, as a human baby named Jesus. Hopefully that made sense. If not, send me an email. Verse 37 Jesus said, if I do not perform the deeds of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, even if you do not believe me, in other words, even if you do not believe my words, believe the deeds so that you may come to know and understand that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Then they attempted again to seize him, but he escaped their clutches. A little bit later in time, Jesus would say in John 14, 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father residing in me performs his miraculous deeds. So again, this is about the essential unity between the Father and the Son, a unity which extends even through the time period when the Son is here on earth as a man. Jesus is speaking God the Father's words, and God the Father is doing miracles through Jesus. Let's finish our text. Verse 40, Jesus went back across the Jordan River again to the place where John had been baptizing at an earlier time, and he stayed there. Many came to him and began to say, John performed no miraculous sign, but everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in Jesus there. So Jesus left the city. He went down the windy mountain road to Jericho. He crossed the Jordan River. And then he went upstream a ways to where John had been before. And as we'll see in John chapter 11, this was about a four days journey for him. The people there looked at Jesus and they thought about what John the Baptist had said about Jesus being the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God. And they realized John's words were true. And so they believed in Jesus. Now, <laughs> you know, we often say that the Gospel of John is kind of an easy book to read, but it's really not, right? I mean, almost every sermon that we've done in the Gospel of John has been a little complicated. There's all these Old Testament allusions and Jesus quoting from Old Testament psalms and prophecies and John referring back to these Old Testament prophecies. And so it always involves a little digging to really get at the truth of what Jesus is saying. And I know this sermon... I mean, you go read that psalm. You see what kind of sense you make out of it if it's different from mine. But it took me hours, really, to figure out what Jesus was saying, to, to be confident about it. But nevertheless, there's really only two truths that you need to take from today. I mean, I hope you take more. But here's the two things that I want to emphasize from Jesus' teaching. First, I'd like you to understand the cause and the result of salvation. 
God the Father chooses to give you to Jesus. And so he extends his grace to you, unmerited favor. He gives that to you. And this heals your spiritual blindness. It allows you to see Jesus clearly, and thus you come to saving faith in Jesus. You believe in his identity and his promise. In human terms, this results in you following Jesus and beginning to become more like him. In divine terms, it means you have been granted eternal life, true spiritual life that begins right now, but which will never end. And the second truth is, I want you to believe that if you have this eternal life, that you can never lose it. It can never be taken away from you. It is God the Father who chooses to save you. And there is no force in the universe that can undo that. No force in the universe who can stand against God. This salvation is a gift. It's not something you earned. And so you cannot unearn it. In fact, our salvation is based on the righteousness of Christ being allocated to us. It's not based on whether we are righteous or not. So you can never unearn it. If you are a follower of Jesus, he promises, I give eternal life to you and you certainly will not perish into eternity. No one will snatch you from my hand. This is Jesus' promise. We can believe it. We can trust in it. We can rest easy in it. In response to this gift, this promise, let's rejoice every day that we know something better is coming. And let's rejoice that we know we belong to Jesus even now, and so we are safe in Him. Let's praise His name in church on Sunday morning, but also in our homes, and yes, even out on the streets in the sense that we are praising His name to all whom we know. And let's truly learn to follow Him, to learn to be like Him, and to do the work He has given us. And right now, let's pray. Jesus, thank you. We, we praise you because of who you are. Even if you did nothing for us, we would praise you because you are the divine Son of God. And at Christmas, we celebrate that miracle of incarnation so that you are the Son of God incarnate. You are God who came to earth as man. You took on real flesh and blood. You took on a human soul. You walk to the earth as a sinless, perfect person. We praise you for that, even if it wasn't to our benefit. But then we know it was to our benefit. We know that you show us the way to God, and you show us what human life can look like and should look like, and you died for us on the cross so that we could have knowledge of God, so that we could have forgiveness and reconciliation with God, so that we could have eternal life, true spiritual life that begins right now and extends past the grave, past the end of the earth as we know it, past the end times, all the way through eternity, forever. So we praise you and we thank you. And I ask, Lord, as the pastor here, that you would help each one of us to hold on to those promises and that it would bring us transcendent joy and peace, the kind of joy and peace that can only come from you, from the Holy Spirit, the kind of joy and peace that exists even when we're having that bad day or bad month. When we have great reason for sorrow, we can still have joy with our sorrow, a joy at life, a joy at salvation, a reason to go on another day. And we pray for a sense of peace. We pray for an end to our anxieties, our stresses, our depressions, our addictions. We pray, Lord, for true peace that can only come from you and can only come if we reflect on these promises. We pray for your deliverance in that sense, too. We love you. We're so thankful that you loved us first. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love.
Please help us this week to keep that in mind. Amen.